Hello and welcome to the final part of our M4P webinar series, Reinventing Performance Strategy. So this one is A Players Want Vision, how to use your performance and people strategy to attract top hires. How, how many people don't want that? That sounds like the perfect thing to talk about here on this beautiful summer day. So as always, we do want this to be interactive though. We wanna answer as many questions as we possibly can. Um, please, we encourage you to interrupt us as much as you can. Ask questions along the way. We're going to try to answer those questions as we go as well. Um, we do have a Q&A section at the very end of the webinar today. Um, however, like I say, please feel encouraged to interrupt, ask questions. Our presenters are ready and willing to do that. So it's never a distraction. We'll, we'll answer them for you. Um, today's topic is all about how we get into those top players. And we've got the perfect people to lead us here today. We've got Chris Hamilton, a senior director at Titus Talent Strategies, as well as Anthony Piccolo, the founder and president of Performance Scoring, uh, who's developed the M4P software platform. Uh, really excited for both these gentlemen to join us today. My name is Mike Kinsey, vice president here at Titus Talent Strategies. So like I was saying that today's, today's um, topic all revolves around the story of M4P and the goal that we've had in developing this tool is we really are looking to turn managers into coaches and teammates into top performers. And ultimately we hope that this can really help optimize your business and the strategy in which that you run your businesses as well. Today, specifically, we are gonna be talking about the A players and they are a very, very different breed. And when you think of the, the B players that might be within your businesses, A players are highly competitive and they're looking for very different things. They, if they have a lack of direction or opportunities, they're not receiving feedback, they don't feel like they can make an impact, that's when you're gonna lose them from an engagement standpoint and sometimes even from a performance standpoint. And you see with so many people leaving organizations, these are not the people that you want to lose. And so we wanna talk very deeply about how we can not only retain them, but how we can create opportunities through your management, through your coaching, to make sure you feel equipped as leaders and coaches within an organization. Um, I think we should just get right into it. Chris, you gotta tell us how we can keep and retain these people. How do we even do this thing? Thanks, Mike. One of the things that are really important to keep and retain these A players is to understand how they think and how they're wired, right? So A players, I always think of, uh, of the analogy of uh, a climber versus a camper. And a climber is someone who is reaching to that next opportunity, right? They're really thinking about what's next for them in their career progression. And uh, they're always moving forward where a, a camper, you know, again, you're going to need a, a, a mix maybe of, of both, but someone who's really, really not content where they're currently at. They want to do well, but they're also reaching into what's next for them over the next two, three to five years. And so another analogy could be pioneers versus settlers, someone who's pioneering in their role, someone who's really trying to push the envelope forward. How they think is growth. They think about what's, uh, how they can continue to add value to their current, current job. So um, day one, A players are really looking for a bigger job than they've ever had before. And so, you know, the hook is something I really want you guys to focus on. What is the hook? What is the attraction piece of the job? And, you know, big surprise, it's not the job description. The job description does not sell. It's not meant to really inspire. The hook is really communicating how they're going to grow and develop as a candidate, especially the younger generation. They're really interested in who, what's, my, what's my personal and professional development and how is this job going to help grow that? And as you heard earlier today, a majority of employees, they're, they're leaving right now, their organizations, because they're looking for growth and development of what's next. So honestly, um, it's if the studies show about half of your employees, if, they're, if they can't see what's next for them in the next 12 months, they're going to start taking those phone calls from, from recruiters and emails. Um, the other half of employees, they leave because of, you know, boss fit or lack of job fit. So we're not talking about that in this moment, but just recognizing that um, envisioning them for the future is super employee and it's super important. 
they're just hungry for what's next for them. Um, what's really interesting, if you think about a, a panorama of a, a group photo, I always love to mention this because in the group photo, you've ever been in a group photo, uh, maybe there's 50 people in it. Where, where's the first place your eyes go? You're always looking for you. You're like, where am I? Oh, am I, are my eyes open? Am I smiling? Do I look cool? <laughs> and all, all those questions. Um, and that's important because that's a good analogy for um, our, our employees. You know, they want to obviously know where the group is and uh, what it, it, is it something that's inspiring to them and that they feel a part of, do they feel part of the community? But they're also looking, where am I? Where am I in the overall picture? And uh, how do I fit into the narrative of this current, of, 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 of the job and of the company? So going into career development, I was just really important. A, I like to say a one size fits all approach is really, it, it's expired. That's really not available or something that's, that's um, I think helpful in the current workplace. And so people have different strengths and desires for them within their career. And so really recognizing that a cookie cutter approach in talent development um, is not gonna inspire, it's not gonna equip and retain your people. And so in more than ever, and again, I know I'm in many ways probably preaching to the choir, you guys get this, but it just, it's really interesting to, to note how some employers don't recognize that people have different career interests. They have different strengths and weaknesses. And they, the, the job that they're doing isn't really um, pulling those out of them. So <clears throat> how, do you, how do you create a job that really inspires them, right? How do you create a job that really gets them to shine in their current role? Uh, because as an employer, we're really wanting to make sure that they can see themselves over the next three to five years, again, in that picture that I just mentioned. So what I want you guys to think about is, is less about a linear career progression, you know, that is kind of a line, one to the next, and more like a lattice. Visualize a, a career pathway for them. It could be up and, you know, to the right or up and to the left. It, it, you know, it, they could leapfrog somebody else, but you want to find them in the organization over the next three to five years to saying, hey, based upon your strengths and, 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 and desires, what I always like to call their ambition line. Everybody has an ambition line. Everybody has a, uh, a desire to, to be, do, and accomplish certain things, both for their professional and personal life. And wouldn't it be nice if, if, our, if our companies could, could add to that? <clears throat> so highly different people, they're, they're looking for clarity around those things. And they want to make sure that their current seat, they know what they're doing. They're clear around their objectives so that they understand, hey, once I finish this assignment, so it's, right, if their current job is an assignment. Once I finish this, what's next for me so that I can continue to make an A in my career? Um, they're really serious about that. We can't, re we can't, we can't be obscure in, in this because that's not going to inspire them and it's not going to keep healthy people, right? So lastly, I want to talk about the uh, kind of the generational focus because right now we have a generation right now that is Money is not the end all be all. Money is important, right? We all have to get paid and feel like we are valued for our contribution, but it's not the ultimate. It, it, it's certainly important, but the ultimate is, is, is really meaning and purpose. And, and this may sound like, okay, a little bit more, uh, you know, obscure and, but, but it's really important, especially the younger generation, you know, they, they want to know, know that what they're doing matters because they're putting in 40 to 60 hours a week. And they can do that anywhere. Right now, they have an option. They can say, listen, I, I could work at company A, B, or C, which company actually moves and motivates me, right, in a way that their impact on the world is positive. And so that's an important piece to really, to really understand is that how you incentivize them for what you're doing. I mean, the ping pong table and the family culture bit doesn't really sell anymore. Everybody is saying that, and it just it falls flat. And so what's really important to say, this is what we're about. This is why we do what we do as a company. And within your current role, this is how we're giving back. Here's the, um, you know, the, the generous side of what we do as a firm. And that's really important because um, meaning and purpose, um, you know, you guys may have read the Daniel Pink's book on, it's called Drive. It's how to motivate people. And they basically says that mastery, meaning, and purpose are the three key indicators that drive and move people to make decisions. So as long as we can help them become a master, though so we're talking about career development, um, maybe an emerging leader program and uh, mastery and purpose and meaning, those are very, very important um, in the job as we're looking to inspire and retain our people. 
man, Chris, you're, you're so spot on. And, you know, when we're, we're talking about mastery and, you know, you really, you really need to know where you stand, right? You know, a players, you know, we, we want to show that our organization's ready for them, right? Um, they need performance objectives. You know, they lay out exactly what outcomes an employee is responsible for. High achievers like success, but they must know what success looks like because without any goal, target, or metric around performance, your people will feel like they're, they're just floating in the wind, and that's not what we want. We want purpose-driven right, with clarity around performance objectives that motivate and remove the stress that comes from lacking the self-evidency of purpose around work. Um, you know, a performance objective is an expected outcome, right? It's a result or accomplishment for our people. It's not so much about the person's daily checklist, but more about an end goal or an optimal outcome for them and, and the organization as a whole. They need, a, they need to be measurable and just as importantly, quantifiable, right? And we got to make them believable, all right? Have something tied to them. Give them a reason to buy in, right? Buy-in is of critical importance in all of this. And there are metrics, uh, they are a metric of success, which is kind of what we're after, right? We know that job descriptions, we've already said it, you know, fall critically short of this because they lack the level of detail and specificity around performance objectives generally, right? The most effective performance objectives are measurable or quantifiable, right? So in other words, they have numbers tied to them. Some positions have objectives that are easy to measure, sales roles, or, you know, our great, great example, think of hitting your quota, right? 500,000 in whatever period, right? Other positions have more kind of like esoteric kind of goals, right? They, they might need a little work to define. The definition is critically important in both cases, you know, your team is better positioned to succeed when they can evaluate their performance uh, based on the numbers, numbers that have an objective, self-evident understanding, right? I need to know. Not only do I need to know, it, it needs to be apparent, evident. I need to see it, believe it, right? And there are some positions, you know, where, where quantifying success is maybe not an option or a very difficult one to obtain, but the next best pro uh, approach is kind of develop objectives that are as specific as possible, right? I, the specificity specific is really important in all of this. Oh, that's a good word. But we believe that every role can and should have clearly defined performance objectives. Without them, we're essentially asking your employees to hit a target with a blindfold, right? Does everybody on your team know their objectives? Performance objectives provide the direction your employees need to know about what matters and how they should prioritize their time. They help the freshest hire get their bearings and learn how to navigate their new position, right? We want them to focus on what matters. High achiever self-coach, right? And to self-coach, you need some self-evidency, right? I, I don't know where to coach myself if I don't, from a measurable, quantifiable standpoint, know where that coaching should exist, right? So we, we need to know where they're at, where we're at relative to our expectations, ideally in real time or almost real time so they can pivot to the optimal outcome. You know, that's one of the things we're trying to solve here at M4P, you know, performance objectives, this is a, re, you know, revolutionary, right? I mean, people have been measuring performance over time. What we're trying to do is give that, that, that measurable, that objective measurable, uh, uh, some self-evidency and relative time, meaning that I know right now where I stand before the outcome has actually arrived. So maybe I can take a little bit control or our people can take a little bit more control. And management needs this, so they're in a position to coach them to that success. Now, finally, you know, if you've sat on these webinars before or heard us talk about M4P, feedback around performance is really what drives people to the next level. It not only drives them, it helps us drive them, and, it, and it's a self-motivating driver of our own performance, right? And not only that, performance objectives, while providing visibility, you know, an insight individually, they help us as managers. So we can, we can meet our people when they're crushing their goals to give them that positive recognition or when they're not show them where they can improve. And so by establishing these, these performance objectives, we're positioned, management is positioned to coach, 
to our and our people's best so they can see, so their self-evidency, so they can, they can become the success we all hope them to be. Mike, I know uh, when we talk about feedback, this is kind of something that you're passionate about. I mean, where's your head at in this? Big time. Yeah, when I, when I look at feedback, I think it all starts with you have to come up with a collective vision, a vision that you are able to use to inspire your teams. And I uh, heard a cool story the other day to share. It was all about the moon landing. And it was about what NASA did and what they planned to try to get to the moon. And they had a lot of tries uh, to get there. But overall, the, the leaders at the top, their goal was to land on the moon. Now, do you think that those leaders knew specifically how to do that? That probably not all the intricacies that were needed. They needed a massive team to be able to accomplish that. But they knew that was their main goal. And when a company doesn't have a very clear vision and goal, it's very hard to then build those performance objectives and get people inspired because people all the way down to the individuals that were cleaning the rooms and making sure that they were sterilized for the astronauts. If JFK himself walked in there, they could actually say, hey, you got to get out of here. This is going to be a negative to the mission overall that we have. And so it's just very encouraging to be able to see that. Before I dig into some of the, the consistent real-time feedback categories, there's two questions that came through. First one for Chris, it was about with everything about the job description, you know, the classic job descriptions that have come up that Anthony was talking through. What do you think job descriptions should look like now that assuming they should look differently to attract A players these days? That question came from Melissa. Uh, that's a great question, Melissa. Um, a few things on a job description, um, you know, we often see job descriptions needing to have, let's just say five to 10 years experience with you know, this type of qualification. And, and, and those, those, are, those are of course interesting, right? But the experience, you're, it's not so much they need to have five or 10 years experience because I don't know about you, but how many people you know that have five or 10 years of experience in this field, they still can't perform on the job, right? So what we're more interested in is say, okay, what does that five to 10 years experience allow you to do? So really thinking about it in terms of performance. Okay, well, I need you to carry three to four projects of $20 million each and be able to run you know, a team of five people and be able to make sure that they're on time and on budget over the course of 90 days or 180 days. That's a bit more clear, right? And that five to 10 years experience helps, um, helps, quant helps understand that usually when you have that, you're able to accomplish this. But the second piece, uh, job description is not inspiring. So what's really interesting is that we love to create for our, for our clients what we call um, a why document. Like, why should they work uh, because it's important to really understand what moves and motivates the employee and uh, really inspiring them with what we also call the EVP, the employee value proposition. It basically is saying, hey, I could choose from among any you know, employer in the marketplace, what makes you so special? And what's important for you to know as a firm is how do you become and how do you articulate that you're the employer of choice? And that is key. And again, it's beyond the ping pong table and the free, you know, food. It's it's really understanding what moves and motivates a person. And so, what we see, not to, I could talk about this all day, you guys, but we got to get to more. But three areas, and I'll leave it this: to really move and motivate a person is an increase in job stretch or challenge. Right? They don't want to be bored. An increase in growth. We talk about career growth, and then an increase in impact. So that that intrinsic value that. Um, meaning and purpose. Again, you're thinking more generationally now because the younger generation, they care about autonomy and meaning and purpose. And that's an important piece to say, this is who we are. This is why we exist. That's why Simon Sinek blew up. What was it? Maybe now 20 years ago. I feel like it's such a still relevant topic yeah. is go for why. So. Yeah. No, it's, it's so true. I, I agree. The majority of job descriptions, so what Melissa is saying here, they're not super exciting at all. It is very, it's that sterile work environment vibe that they give. And to Anthony's earlier point of outlining exactly what needs to be done and enhancing that job description to become a bit more of a performance profile and what they can expect, it really allows for ultimate clarity between the incumbent and the, the new manager for that person to make sure that there's no questions. I think 
it, it's a perfect segue into one more question for you, Anthony. It's sure. talking about performance objectives from Darren. So it says, I like the points that you made about performance objectives. Can a tool like M4P set up performance objectives? Can you set up performance objectives within it? And you have to do that for every single role differently. Awesome. Hey, Aaron, I really appreciate the question. And and uh, it, uh, so to, to shortly answer your question, you, you can set up performance objectives in M4P for for each role, uh, for for individuals, for roles and teams, there are different reasons why you want, why you'd like them, right? Maybe I, I have a role where um, everybody has the same objective, the same finite objective. Um, uh, maybe I have a team of different, a team that has different roles on there with the same objective. There, there are real reasons for, for both. And I, so, so I want to answer that question. I also want to pivot you know, a little bit even back to the job descriptions. Think of how most of these job descriptions are written. When do you write a job description? When you need to hire somebody? Guess what's generally not sitting out there in front of their people every day. It's, it's almost like a value or mission. It's like not, not sitting in front of them all the time. Performance objectives actually help uh, identify and help write that job description. So just the act of measuring and quantifying performance is actually a step in cr creating job descriptions that people can buy into and they can actually believe in. Yeah, that's, Mike, that's good. <laughs> I'll, I'll go right back to, to where we were here before the questions of talking sure. about consistent feedback. Because feedback for me, I think there's this a bit of a misunderstanding within the business world of when these conversations should occur. There is a lot of organizations that we work with that they'll do an annual review conversation um, or they'll do you know monthly touch points with their teammates. When in reality, we feel like this needs to be a lot more consistent. And the way I look at this is when we say we want to help turn managers into coaches is we don't want people just managing. We want people in the weeds coaching with them. So if you look at it as in the sports world, think of football. If you're going to watch the game film after the game and do no coaching throughout the game, how successful do you think those players are going to be without that level of direction? It takes pivots, it takes changes, and it takes that in real time to be able to make that successful. And if we really want people to be engaged with that overall mission that we talked about before, it has to be done consistently. And so I want to feel motivated by the leader on my team that can engage me, that can provide that clarity, but then having courageous candor to be able to give me feedback in the moment and then opening the door for me to be able to give them feedback as well. That can be highly transparent. And so that's definitely one of the big pieces of it. Another area. Oh, oh, sorry, I, I was just going to I jump in on that real quick on the, the feedback piece. I think one of the fears that I think humans have, and I can I, I certainly relate with this, is that we don't want to give feedback because um, it can feel subjective um, and 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 it, we, it also can feel scary. Right. And so when you have an objective data driven um, platform and tool that allows you almost to step away as to. Um, equals looking at a certain problem or uh, whether it's positive or negative feedback, it really helps provide an opportunity to um, be have courageous uh, candor like Mike is saying, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think the, the objectivity is really important in the feedback because it really does come from, um, hey, this is how we're gonna grow. And that contrast of, of your performance, of your objectives, really being that baseline upon which you grow is, is really, really key. So it's not, there's no longer, hey, I feel like you're doing, uh, you could have done better. <laughs> or it had a sense of, no, 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 here's some real opportunities for, for growth and where you just crushed it as well because you set a mark and you just surpassed it in a way to go kind of thing. So I think that's an important piece. Uh, you know when we talk about these things, one of the, you know, feedback, uh, Melissa, <laughs> she's, uh, she's making great points. Feedback has a, not ne has a connotation of it's going to be negative. Well, you know what, actually I totally buy into that too, Melissa. And this is the, this is the thing about feedback is if it's, if it's low frequency, it's going to be very high stakes. 
And and just like when 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 you're when you're not used to having a you know a, a conversation or a meeting, and then you go into a meeting or a conversation for the first time with a new person, there's an anxiety there. But what we want to do is we want to have high frequency engagements of feedback that really have low stakes. And actually, we're trying to do that with performance as well. Like, isn't it scary if you like walk in once a month and you get your numbers for what you did last month? Now you can't do anything about it. It's like getting feedback in a review six months later after the event happened. We want to be real and really in the moment with our people. And we can we can really create a safe space by having those conversations and act, uh, acting on and asking for feedback in a much quicker way. Yeah, it's a great point, Anthony, and the comments coming in are, are so true. It's incredible how A players do want and need to be stretched. So a simple thumbs up, thumbs down in this particular area is really challenging. And we've spent a lot of time talking about performance objectives. It's also important to know that there are skills, values, and behaviors that need to be seen within that individual for every single role to ensure that there's the right person in the right seat. And so that is really critical. And how else do you really do that without that constant communication? And really the, the fruits of this or the byproduct of this ultimately is a relationship with an individual, right? And relationships are really, they're built on several things. I think they're built on communication and proven integrity that's been shown consistently over time. And so when you've really established that trust, you now are able to have those more difficult conversations and those more fruitful conversations because you were able to say things beyond you did great or you did poorly. You can really dig into the weeds and make sure that there is an understanding between the, the two of you. And ultimately what this does when establishing trust is it completely eliminates micromanagement. There isn't that need to jump in and feel because micromanagement, usually the heart of that is a distrust there is a trust in yourself that you can do it better than your employee or your direct report. And so you jump in and do that. And so micromanagement takes a backseat to it. And when people feel like they are being measured on the right things and they're being inspired in the right way, they take ownership of that and you don't even have to micromanage them. And so it really completely changes your culture and creates more of a winning culture of coaching together. So I know we're, we're getting close to uh, ending on, on time. We're usually a little bit late. So just bear with us here. We're almost, we almost got to this part. There's still a couple of questions left that we want to get to as well. But the four keys to a feedback culture, immediacy, informality, improvement, and integration of technology. Now, immediacy is a bit more self-explanatory. It's giving that feedback in the moment Informality is making sure that you don't always have to have something super structured. I personally love the weekly check-in conversations and mixing those up a bit more. And it doesn't need to necessarily be the same exact conversation every time. It can be personal one week, professional one week. It's the consistency of that conversation, which is very important. And knowing that that number three improvement is improvement on both sides, right? It's how can I, as a leader, um, be more present? How can I be more consistent with you and be more impactful for you as well? But then also giving that real critical feedback that's going to help those A players stretch and grow. And integration of technology is very underrated because so many of us do business on spreadsheets or advanced spreadsheets that have a really beautiful shell, but are pretty much a spreadsheet or a, a Word document. And, and Mike, the fourth point actually informs the top three ones. If you can integrate or use or utilize, like shameless plug M4P, those first three things can get a whole lot easier to do. Com completely agree. So that's, that's a big piece of it. Now, I know we do have a couple more questions that have come through. Let me ask one here from Sam. And please, if you have more, we'll stay on. We've, we'll be happy to stay on and answer all the questions that you have. Otherwise, if we can't get to them for whatever reason we go over, we'd be happy to go through those individually one-on-one -on -one with you. But um, please stick around if you want to hear some of these. But Sam asks, how can my company move from only being concerned about job descriptions and shift to a performance objective model? So if I'm understanding this correctly, Sam, 
Um, how can my company move from only being concerned about job descriptions and shift to a performance objective model? I think this is another area where it, it does take a bit more of a village to do that. There always needs to be champions internally to be able to do this, but ultimately it's, it's kind of the slow play and making sure that each role is individually uh, contributed to by the, the champions of that role. So the hiring managers of that role, they need to be involved in understanding what is attractive about this role. And the question that I love to ask the most to the hiring managers is, why do you work here? What, what, is, what is keeping you here? Because ultimately the thing that is keeping them there is the most attractive sellable point of your organization and or that role. And so starting there, I think is, is certainly a, a good one. All right, we've got another one here from Lisa. Chris, this looks like a good one for you. For the new generation of hires, what are some cultural offerings that we can bring to the table? That's a great question, Lisa. Um, and I, I like the even I like that you're even asking the question because it's it, it means that you're being thoughtful and empathetic, and uh, and that's honestly one of the things that this new generation needs is they need us to be empathetic about what what matters to them. And I'd say two, maybe three areas. Number one would be flexibility. <laughs> this is not going to be a big one, big surprise, but that that nine to five, um, it's it's a little bit of an old old model. And so we need to let them be flexible. Um, and, and, and so often I grew up in that work-life balance. Uh, they care more about a work-life blend. You know, if they, if they need to power up at eight o'clock at night or do something you know, early in the morning and whatnot and have, you know, an hour in the day where they do something different, that may be fine, fine as long as they get their job done, right? And so those quantifiable objectives are there so they can have flexibility. So the idea is high accountability, but low control because we have some performance objectives. So we can let them be flexible, right? I know not every industry is, is quite that flexible, but I'd say the more you can move towards that hybrid flexibility is really important. Another thing would be um, real-time feedback, but in the way of compensation and um, shout outs, okay? So rewards have to be more, that, that feedback loop has to be shorter. So that younger generation is not waiting for that six month or annual review where they get that little pay increase. If you can find ways to give them a little bit more of a bump more frequently, and even just a, an emotional bump as well, right? Now, it doesn't always have to be monetary, but where they're getting that, that's going to keep them hooked more, right? Because they're, they're looking for They're in this generation right now where dopamine hits are all the time. I mean, let's think about it. Like Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, and, and TikTok. Right, they're getting these dopamine hits, and so we, and in a way, we have to know that that's just their world. So let's give in to that in that way. And then the last piece would be generosity. They want to know that uh, the company they work for is generous, and so uh, whether or not it's a nonprofit that they're a part of, or whatever, giving them an opportunity to just give back into their communities and sewing back into the people and the lives of those that are around them is really important to them. I love that about this generation. That wasn't really my generation. We were all about us. <laughs> but, um, but for them, it really is more about uh, the impact and the mark they're leaving in the world. So those are three areas I'd say would really help um, incentivize the offering. Yeah, that's really, really good, Chris. Yeah, we've got more questions coming through, which is amazing. We've got one from Maria coming from us here. It says, what is the best way to discover what our top employees' goals and strengths are. Anthony, what do you think? Well, I'm gonna, I can answer that a few different ways. I'll start with the strengths. So uh, we built this whole cool platform, M4P, but, and it's actually designed to help you do that uh, uh, on, both, on both accounts, uh, specifically on the strengths. Hey, guess what? Let's go back to performance objectives. If, if you're setting and measuring and quantifying performance and you're, you're engaging your people on that, guess what, those strengths are gonna rise to the top. And it's not just performance objectives, it's also about the skills and behaviors they need to exhibit to achieve success in the, the role and measuring that and engaging in that. Not, not just once a year, twice a year, or even just four times a year in your, 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 your reviews, but actually having some real-time coaching, some real-time engagements, some check-ins, right? Those the, now those that review cadence is critically important when you're talking about the two-way long conversation on goals, right? Because that's a two-way conversation. What's your goal? What's my goal? What's our collective goal, right? Because we need alignment too, right? That helps them define and decide, you know, what the future looks like as well as you as the manager. So, you know, having a platform that actually encourages and prompts 
prompts the rhythm because this is these are rhythms right rhythms of engagement right I want to have a I want to have a conversation I want to have a rhythm of you know talking about your goals where you want to be where you hope to be where you want us to be as your organization right and I want to align those things I want to align those strengths I want to align those goals to our mission and our values because as Chris was talking about the the ways that you can uh, bring some cultural offerings at the end of the day, you know, he's talking about all these things. There's a lot of this is about alignment, right? I want to be aligned as a, as a person who works for an organization. I want to be aligned to, to the values, the mission. I, I want to see the generosity. I want to see camaraderie. I want to see responsibility and accountability, right? And, and, and these conversations, those check-ins, those real-time coaching events, those reviews, and really the feedback, performance objectives, these are interconnected and interdependent things and make all of this much easier. It's like the question earlier about job description. I was like, well, let's, if you started with performance objectives and skills, values, and behaviors, the job description actually ends up writing itself. So it's like, you know, we got to kind of like think about the, uh, uh, the syntax, right? Think of how it's all put together and maybe not start with the product. Let's start with the variables. Yeah, I, I some of the questions coming through seem very similar. I think people are looking for, to use your word, Anthony, specificity into Thank you. <laughs> the process um, in terms of questions like this. What kind of feedback do you, it's not what type of feedback do you get, but essentially how often are you recommending giving that feedback? And we really believe that it does need to be constant. Again, weekly one-on-ones to at least have a check-in and see where you can best help needs to be attached to basically a career mapping plan, right? Make sure that you're always working towards something and that that something is going to be beneficial for the individual, but ultimately the business. And when it comes to those performance reviews, we talk to a lot of our, our different partners that um, they maybe do an annual performance review and some none at all. And so that can be really damaging to somebody's just overall engagement and satisfaction within the role. And so we do recommend at least having even a watered down version of a performance review every quarter and make sure that you're giving that information where you can look at their performance, the skills that they need to continue working on, any observable behaviors that need adjustments or for them to continue to do, um, and the values of your organization. Is there an alignment overall with your, your core values or your lived values for the organization? And if you can get into a better cadence, you know, we obviously could help you with what that can look like, but it's more important to have that consistency in the cadence when it comes to giving that consistent feedback. And then if you do have a tool like an M4P where you can be giving constant in the moment feedback cross functionally throughout different teams, all the better, more data points for you to be able to look at your teammates and how they're performing with other people within the organization when you can't possibly uh, babysit and watch every moment. That's not what it's about. It's about gathering that information. And I think that could really, really be beneficial. I'm getting the cue to, to move forward here to the top secret <laughs> announcement that people are probably wondering what on earth we have on the screen. Anthony, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about the top well, secret. Well, I, I am. We're, we're just so excited. We've been working on something for well over a year now. Um, um, a project management uh, module that fits seamlessly in inside M4P. So we talk about performance and, you know, performance is, you know, the execution of action, right? Well, how do you execute that action at scale, right? How do, how do I take, uh, you know, our initiatives and our projects and those projects tasks and how do I meet our people in the moment to show them how, you know, how that janitor, how that janitor is helping land the men on the moon right when jfk was having that conversation and we've got something that's revolutionary i'm so excited and we've taken it a step further every, every one of us are in meetings we're in a meeting right now it's a webinar and sometimes these meetings can be disjointed non-standardized we've we've got a way to bring everything that we've talked about today in the one place that we, and the one thing that we all do, which is meet with our people. And we're so excited to show this. So, so, so excited to, whether it's scoreboards, your objectives, right in your meeting for the teams and the individuals and the roles, um, uh, how we actually conduct it, right? Like understanding our, 
our uh, behavioral, our behavioral profiling, we're, we're, we're going to be helping people make informed decisions. We want to present the needles so you don't have to dig through the haystacks. And I'm so excited to show you guys here soon how that works. Yeah, we, we would love to show you. I think one of my favorite parts of using the meetings function of it right now is being able to have that right within my dashboard to say, all right, here are my, my quarterly objectives that I need to complete. Here's my specific milestones. And then here are some to do's or action items that come from that. Um, same with my direct reports is I can go through those in our weekly meetings and make sure that they're on task and see exactly where I can help. And so it's like you say, it's optimizing the way that we just go about our business because we all have meetings. I want to make sure that those things are as productive as possible. So I don't get a lot of size and eye rolls when it comes to, <laughs> to setting meetings like meetings of past. So Again, we would love to show you that. Come check it out. Uh, there's a QR code right here on the screen. If you want to put your, your phone up to it, you just open your camera and it'll automatically pop up the site that you can go to and you can book a demo. We are offering a 90 day zero obligation trial of M4P. Uh, we'd love to show you that. Love our team to, to meet yours and see how well we can serve you. Other than that, I don't believe we have additional Great. questions. Yes, this was fantastic. We really appreciate all the questions and interaction that came through from the group. Anthony, Chris, amazing as always. Thanks so much for your wisdom and insight. And uh, enjoy the rest of, of your days, your summers. And hopefully we talk to you all soon. Thanks so Absolutely. much. Thanks, guys. Thanks.